fabulous pleasure to introduce Talvin Singh, who is, in, in my opinion, an innovator in almost every sense of the word, particularly through his performance, through his use of technology. He's very much regarded as someone who's created a brand new genre, which is now fully adopted in terms of Asian electronica, um, or Asian underground, or Indian underground, and this, you know, a new type of music that's had a really massive sort of creative, but also cultural influence on, um, on, on music and, and a lot of other f areas of society. Talvin, of course, uh, won the uh, Mercury Music Prize in 1999, I believe, which is a phenomenal accolade and, uh, and great, great sort of testament to, to his early work, which is, has only gone from strength to strength since. So, um, Talvin Singh. <laughs> I sort of wanted to ask you first off, if you could just tell us a little bit about your sort of traditional uh, learnings of, of tabla and, and traditional Indian music, and then kind of how that developed into your own sort of experimentation or development of, of your own style that took off as, as something other people wanted to, to work with. So I'll just pass over to you. So I suppose we'll take some time um, to talk about my kind of early... Um, childhood or days in, in being born and brought up in this city, London, East London. Um, I kind of, my background um, is of kind of Sikh origin, even though I'm not a fully fledged practicing Sikh, whatever that means today. Um, the, the temple, the, the, the Gurdwara was a place where I always loved going because it was a place of service. Everybody had, you know, just um, spoke very softly and with a lot of love. And, and, uh, and most important, um, there was brilliant music almost, you know, three, four hours every day. And, um, and also very, very tasty food afterwards. Um, so, when I first heard um, or visually seen Indian musicians just sit down cross-legged in a kind of meditative state playing these instruments, really relaxed and playing like ultra-fast, um, it just really excited me. So, I, I remember I used to actually sit down in my grandmother's knees and, and just imitate, just play her knees uh, until they really got pretty weak. <laughs> so, so, you know, I would see these drummers um, perform and just wanted to do the same thing and physically. So for me, it was obviously there was a sonic experience which spiritually did something very magical um, inside, my, inside my spirit, but there was also a physical uh, kind of curiosity I had about the kind of yogic idea of sitting cross-legged and pretending like you're kind of doing nothing, but you're doing a lot. Um, so that's, that was my early kind of, uh, I suppose, influence in terms of drumming, percussion, music, uh, being attracted to, to sound. Um, so I started playing um, every Thursday. I would go to the temple and, 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 and just play. I actually didn't have any drums till I think the age of nine. I think nine, I was nine years old and my grandfather uh, got me these pair of drums. But by the age of eight, I was all, I was playing, I played my first concert when I was like eight years old. So I was actually playing concerts and I was embarrassed to tell them I, I actually don't have drums. So they, they used to get the drums for me to play. And, and then by the age of nine, ten, I got my first drums and I still have that drum. Um, so that was the early stage. And, and at the same time, I think, in parallel to that, I was always listening to Top of the Pops, watching Top of the Pops. 
and um, started practicing snare drum, started wanting to play the drum kit, but again, didn't have a drum kit uh, and too expensive. So I started learning snare drum. Luckily, uh, in, in school we had we had a teacher, a drum teacher, used to come in and teach us um, snare drum. His name was Mr. Harding. He was he was a um, I believe he was a police part-time policeman and a part-time judo instructor, and he used to come to our school and teach us snare drum. So we learned Richard's romp and, you know, all these marching rhythms. And he, he, was, he was just a fantastic person, fantastic. He had a huge influence, a huge influence on me. Um, you know, I would turn up late because there was always issues in our schools. And I, was tur I would turn up late and he would, he would just be like, you know, we, there would be one snare drum and about five of us around this drum. And, and yeah, usually I turned up late and he would be, yeah, kind of cross, but he would just be like, look, look who's here. What do you think this is, the Lib Liberty Hall? Like, why are you like 10 minutes late? And, it, and he would be like, look, Packy, play Richard's romp. And I would play Richard's romp. So, you know, that was, that was the experience. That was the experience. And he was, I mean, when you use a term like that today, you know, you're kind of in trouble. <laughs> um, but in those days, nobody really cared, you know. You just, uh, there was none of this politically correctness. And he's, all he knew is I could play better Richard's Romp than anyone else. And he loved me for that. And uh, so from that period, there was a parallel space of having an instrument which comes from a tradition back home, yet it's kind of available uh, in in the temple. And and there was also soirees in our families, which, you know, there was musicians which used to come from India or Pakistan, and 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 they will they will perform, and thirty of us would get together and we would have a sit down, and um, and you know drinks afterwards and all of that stuff too. Um, which I didn't get involved in, uh, but I definitely got involved in the music. So that was my early, early kind of days with music um, until the age of 12, I think I took my first trip on the tube to Carnaby Street and put a record. And then I started traveling to from from Leighton on the Central Line to Ealing Broadway, get the 207 bus, go to Southall. I started buying records religiously. I started buying records every Saturday if I didn't have a gig. So I was earning money doing these small little gigs. You know, the lovely tabla boy. Oh, we don't need to, we don't need to bring a tabla player from. Uh, from from India or Pakistan, there's a young kid who plays. He's he's okay. We'll get him to play. They used to give me toffee money, like you know, ten pound was a lot of money at that time. <laughs> and um, so I would spend that money buying buying material, source material, records, records which I couldn't even hear, records which just the artwork kind of led a certain curiosity in me of like, well, I need to check this record out. And, you know, luckily my father had, um, he had a Japanese turntable which had a pitch control and a little wheel on the side. So, and there was a cassette deck underneath that. So I started collecting these Indian classical records um, at the same time I was buying electro records. But the Indian classical records, I started finding a way to learn tabla out of observation. So I used to record those tabla solos on a record, on a vinyl, and on the cassette, but in a, on a slow speed, on different speeds. Um, and I would play them back on my cassette Walkman, slow, 
And that's how I started learning tabla patterns. Um, in term, well, learning them, I suppose, in terms of sound, rhythmic pattern, um, and then physically, I kind of knew where my hands and fingers need to go to make certain sounds. Uh, so there, there was a fundamental kind of um, understanding. Um, yeah. That's... So when did you start introducing, uh, you know, your own electronic kind of compositions, I suppose, into your process? I think that started happening around... Um, Yeah, around the age of four, uh, 13, 14, I was buying a, like I was buying a lot of these electro records uh, from a label called Street Sounds, which were importing hip hop. Uh, a guy called uh, Morgan Morgan Khan in Ealing, he 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 was importing these records, and we would get hold of these these records, Africa Bombata records, with just eight or eight, very minimal, very minimal kind of instrumental hip hop beats with just 808 patterns. And, and then there was, there was, you know, emerging kind of breakdance scene happening. And we, you know, we were too, 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 too young and, and um, to get into clubs. So, so the club was the street, you know, we had this thing going on on the street where there was music, there was dance and, and fantastic time. So I, I started making my first tracks for the dance where I would get, I had uh, one record player and play like an African Mabata beat and then play tabla and record it on the, on the next deck. Um, and all externally, no internal kind of stuff going on. Um, so from speaker to involvement to speaker B. And I did that about two or three times until I had a really, really cool thing going on. Uh, then I realized there was a lot of noise. It got noisier. And, and luckily I found this button called noise, uh, Dolby, no Dolby noise reduction. And I used to press that and then re-record it and that did the trick. Um, but it didn't, at the same time, I wasn't happy with that button because the button made, made things sound less exciting. It took all the kind of excitement away. So that's when I started, that was the point when it happened and um, it as in, you know, I never thought about it. I just, I was just having fun with these two elements, which I was involved in. I was equally involved in both of them. Um, but in terms of, I suppose, um, yeah, I still question myself, what, what's deeper inside me? Is it? playing tabla physically or is it making beats um, but I suppose it's a constant debate but I really love playing I love playing I love playing this instrument and uh, so the lectures you know the electricity can go off and I will miss it you know but I'll, I'll still be okay uh, but I do miss it and, and I'm equally involved in that side uh, well, um, so so luckily my my father was working for a company called Granada and for, he worked for Granada for almost like two and a half, two de I think two decades, maybe slightly less. Uh, so myself and three sisters, you know, he kind of br um, he brought us up uh, with this profession he had. He was, you know, drinking tea around people's homes and fixing their TVs and VHS videos. Because at that time, nobody used to, you know, we, we never brought, you never bought um, TVs. You, you rent them, and then somebody like my father would come and fix them, repair them. He's also repaired compressors for me and some gear, which is really good, you know. He's not funky junk, but... Um. <laughs> and um, so how did that progress into sort of, you know, more professional recording? You know, how, what was your kind of route into to recording your first sort of releases and things like that? The releases, um, well, I had a long, uh, before all of that happened, um, I kind of had a long career as a session musician. That lasted for a good 
I mean, I, I see it as long because there was a point where it got really tiresome and I didn't want to do it anymore. But for about, I think, six, seven, seven years, seven years, I did a lot of sessions. I've, I've played on a lot of records. And uh, percussion, blah, blah, and then eventually a bit of programming. Um, and then when I, so I did that until I think Bjork's album debut, which I was quite involved in. Um, after that, I kind of, that was it for me, you know, that was it. And I couldn't do more of that. And I was like, I need to really work on my own stuff and I, I want to release my own material. Um, but I definitely come from, I would say, I would say my career uh, in terms of a professional career was established being a working musician, doing sessions. And when I did sessions, you know, I, I usually, yeah, my, my aims and objectives was to get in the groove and do the best and make it, you know, the best performance and understand, understand what the producer needs or what the artist needs. And sometimes I would try to give it more than that. So most sessions I did, you know, the producers were always so, so happy with me and they would let me hang out in the control room. And, and I would actually ask them, look, can I just hang out? Like, can you just delay my cabs? They were great days, you know, having a limo parked outside Leighton, you know, can't even fit on the street, you know, waiting for me. And so that's when my parents thought, well, this, yeah, this is, this is okay. This is quite a good job. You know, he's got, there's a driver knocking on the bell with gloves on. And, you know, <laughs> um, so I would be in the control room and say, look, can you just delay my, my cab? Can, do you mind if I just hang out for, two, for a couple of hours? And they were like, yeah, yeah, you know. And there was also a lot of producers at that time from America working in the UK. And, uh, and I would ask them, you know, politely when they had a moment, like, what does, I would look at that lovely Poltec EQ and, and say, what does, what does that do? And how did you get that tabla sound? It changed. I remember I did a session, Spike um, was engineering. Was he producing? Maybe, maybe a bit of both. And, um, and I had asked him, I played congas, and, and he got this incredible sound, like pop, did some magic. And I, I, I was like, how? How did you do that? How is that? And he was like, uh, um, oh, nothing, just just a bit of presence. I was like, what's presence? It's like, oh, just, just 12K, you know, just a bit of air. And I was like, oh, God, this is exciting terminology. I started getting really excited about, about the sonics and studio. And I was always excited about it and wanted to learn, but didn't have access to all of that gear, all, all of that equipment. Um, and the only opportunity was when I did these sessions and I would hang out with the engineers and, and learn something. And so... So in that way, I think I was lucky because I found a way to learn outside of the school, in a way, you know. Um, oh, uh, I think that's certainly from, from what I've known, um, seeing you perform and, and, and a little bit of, of working together is just to see that, how that's developed a lot, you know, so much since then into into your performance as well as your production and all the work you're doing now. But um, actually, I was just wondering if you might talk us a little bit through the um, just just through sort of the tradition and and the sort of the, the acoustics of the tableau and you know how I, I mean obviously it's it's a, a traditional Indian drum, but you know it's it's a lot more there's a lot more kind of um, subtlety to it that makes it makes it what it is. And I assume you know you're one of few people that that really understands all of that to a very fine kind of uh, sort of presence. No, oh, thank you. I, yeah, I think I'm still fascinated by what you've just mentioned, this whole architecture. And especially when I t tune the drums, every t each performance when I'm tuning the drums, I just <clears throat> cannot stop thinking that, well, who actually came up with these ideas? 
And um, so, so much of that, 12K. Maybe we could switch this off. I think that's feeding back. So the tuning is, is it's, yeah, it's, it's a, quite an important part of, of um, the culture, you know, the, the culture of, of the art form. Um, so there's certain things involved in tuning. Um, I mean, obviously there's the pitch, the frequency, matching of frequency with, with the drone, with the tampura. But it's also subjective because I've been in situations where I feel that I've tuned my instrument correct and then somebody, usually where Rob's sitting, front row, who's either not necessarily a musician a practicing musician uh, in terms of a performer may disagree and say it's a bit sharp and this has happened many times and it happens with everybody and so or sometimes the, the often the musician who you're accompanying may say well it's it's a bit flat can you like so it becomes quite subject I mean, and because it's a drum and it's tuned to a note um, and, and it's not tempered. And sometimes your hand and your sensuality can actually alter the pitch. So your instrument may be in tune, but when you're playing it, it, it could seem like it's slightly flat or sharp because you're your, your, your feeling can also change, uh, have, have, have a, um, a kind of response. So that's D, that's tuned to D now. That's E. So you know, <laughs> we have a drum which, which has two, two notes. And so ben between those two notes, there's obviously harmonic, um, harmonic shrutis. So each, um, tone 
also has a syllable as part of the tabla language and it's kind of tonal graphics. So na, pin, tun, that's the e. And then some muted strokes. Tit, tuk, and then the bass drum. Ge, cut, and then the combination of na and ge become da. And then thin and ge become din. And then there's other, a few other strokes like dida dida. Which is like brush, kind of like brush strokes. Um, so that's, that's the language. So the way my, um, or I should say our guru, you know, taught us by just pretty much, there was hardly any time when physically he played in front of me. We, I would just hang out with him every day in India um, and go and buy vegetables or see his friends and... and uh, and just like an assistant in a way, and, and just be with him. And he would teach me, when he was in a mood, he would teach me compositions and patterns and, and poetic kind of motifs, and then very long kind of narrative compositions like... Uh, um, so this was what was going on and still is going on. And um, but there was a point where, you know, because my initial training was out of observation, my teacher, my guru had to be very, very careful with me because he, he knew that there were certain aspects of um, language and vocab which I was weak at. But yet he knew I was flying when it comes to playing and vibing, improvising and grooving. Um, so he didn't want to ruin any of that. And so for year, quite a few years he, he kind of worked very, very hard with me and with a lot of love and and he wanted to keep that in me, that spirit. Um, but at the same time, he wanted me to learn the deep fundamentals of Indian drumming. And, you know, so that's amazing how, how, he, he, how he actually managed that as a teacher, where every individual, you know, has a vibe. So every student, every friend of yours got a vibe and by teaching them, you're also sometimes taking that away by conditioning uh, a student. And so my experience with my teacher was amazing because I know that he really worked very, very hard. So he kept my vibe going and yet he kind of just transcended and blessed me with this kind of you know, idea he had. Um, but shall, can I play a little? Do. Yeah. Please do.
Hi, Tavin. I'm Stu. Hi. Um, just back to the thing you said straight before you performed um, about having a vibe and being taught a more traditional. Did you say was that what your guru was doing, adding the the discipline and yeah. tradition to you? Yeah. Okay. The, um, yeah. The kind of um, yeah, the kind of aesthetics, I would say, the which kind of within and the aesthetics do kind of belong in in a certain repertoire. So that's what he was he was trying to get me more close to. Mm -hmm. So if you were if there was a, a young British double player working maybe in electronics, how important would you say the tradition and discipline are to their ability to be a good player? I think um yeah, I think I think Definitely, I think the aesthetics are important because, um, because I, I suppose tone and voicing is uh, definitely an individual personality if you're a singer, if you're a guitarist, if you're a tabla player. But in tabla in particular, I, it, I think tonality starts getting enriched when you start kind of learning these kind of sacred uh, compositions which are part of this particular repertoire if you have a teacher to guide you quite intimately quite closely you know but these days like learning is become it's become very it's a different thing today how i have kind of been with my teacher and and um i mean today you know because I started learning when, at the time when nobody would teach tabla. So that's when I started learning, when this instrument was not taught, unless you were part of a family, you were a son, daughter of a family. And yeah, at times it would be taught for whatever reason, you know. But So I'm coming from that period, actually, and so I've been really lucky to have this kind of old school kind of teacher guru uh, but today that's not possible because you know i mean i lived with him he used to give me pocket money so my teacher paid me to teach me i mean where's that going to happen today and so so things have changed things have changed amazing like for for the good i suppose i mean today the repertoire of an instrument like tabla has never ever enjoyed exposure and content available, content which is available. And who owns the content? Or at least hosts it, Google, YouTube. On YouTube, I wouldn't say the entire content, but huge repertoire, suddenly, in the space of seven years, it's all out there. And it was never it was never out there. It was always kept so close in the pocket. And so now you've got all young students playing stuff. Um, you've got the great masters, you've got old recordings, which were part of the archives in India. You've got innovative stuff happening, you've got people doing kind of karaoke on Dubla and getting more hits than anybody, you know. <laughs> you know it's, so it, it's a good thing. So now it's really changed because all of a sudden, in terms of education, music education, all, you know, the, the, the masters have got together and said, we've got to teach this. We've got to teach it because it's out there anyway. And if it's out there, it's got to be taught properly. Otherwise, the, comp the compositions, uh, they're going to get ruined if they're not played properly. Because then if I'm not playing a certain thing proper, I'm going to teach it wrong. And then that person, then they just get diluted. So it's important to keep these, you know, I might be sounding like a purist here, um, you know, and, but the only reason why I'm kind of um, into that space is because I feel that there's something in that space. And, and there was a time when I really didn't think too much about that space, you know, because I think that kind of energy, when you're young, you want to play spark, you want to play chops, you want to play fast, you want to you want, you want to groove. Um, but, you know, I've been grooving for some time now. And, um, 
And you know, but my groove stories are really interesting because most of the grooves I play, and I've never talked about this before, but I've had I've got this opportunity right now to share this. Most of the grooves I play are actually grooves which I heard on records. Um, because, you know, we, yeah, we used to go out clubbing, still do, um, listen to a lot, of, a lot of records. And there was a period where Dabla really started coming into, like, deep house music, you know, Andy Weatherall. Once I had heard, I think, Andy Weatherall play a record, and, and I was like, I, I, what's the hurt? And, you know, what's this record? And, and we heard it again, and nobody would tell us what the record was. And, and so we kept on going to the club. And that was the great thing about clubbing those days, was you had to keep going. Because you heard a record, and you didn't know what that record was, and they wouldn't tell you because it was a white label. And he would just hide it. I remember Andy, you know, you'd ask him, like, um, or Darren Emerson, what is that record? They'll be like, yeah, yeah, it's cool, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's... And they'd put it away, you know? So, so that, at that point, some of the things I heard, there was one record um, which they had made, I think, at, at Andrew Weatherall with, with someone who I also kind of got to know called Jag Schooner, the producer, you know, from Uxbridge. And uh, those guys were really incredible in the studio, you know. And so I had asked Jags, what is that record and what, how, what was that tabla in there? And it was just almost like the whole track was just tabla and a bass drum and some, and some noise. And it was on, uh, it was a Chrome, Chrome Assassins record. And then he had told me, he said, oh yeah, yeah, we, Andrew gave us a sample. Andrew had brought this record out, this Indian record. And, 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 you know, this is to an Indian guy who's a programmer, engineer, Jag Schooner. And so Andrew brought this record and he said, look, you know, can you sample that? So Jag sat there with a S, I think it was S1000 Akai sampler, and they sampled it. And I know, I know the original record. I, I, I've got that record. Like I said, I started collecting records, and I've got that record. It was an El Shankar and Zakir Hussein record. There was a tiny little tabla solo in there. Um, there was, it was actually not a solo. It was a small space where El Shanka was just having a breather. And, uh, and I think it kind of, the original kind of went like... Something like that. So they sampled that and played it faster and chopped it about three, four different slices. And on the record... It was like, there was a bass drum, like this kind of tempo. And with the bass drum. When we heard that record, it was just, wow. You know, so a lot of the groove ideas also, they, they came from people chopping up the blah. And then I started relearning a chopped up double up beat, which is kind of a bit crazy, but doable. Um, yeah, I was going to say, actually, because that's very interesting. There's the um, traditional sort of language for the tabla, which you then kind of associate with the performance of the tabla. And it sounds mm. like you've been developing your own language for that in a more sort of, you know, Western sense, let's, let's say. Is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah, definitely, because, like, Again, because there's a language, like for example, like so this groove, it sounds good. Does it sound good? You know, just, just one of them, but, but if you're, now if I started analyzing it and singing it, it's not that easy to do. But neither is it easy to play it. Because I'm also, there's one stroke I'm using, which is like a kind of rim shot stroke, which is actually probably the most pivotal stroke to play this. And that stroke is actually not in the language of tabla, which is, 
And somebody, had, I, I, I was playing something like this. Something like that, and, and in front of my guru. And he said, what's that? And I was, I was like, Guruji, it's what everyone's playing these days, you know? <laughs> Inside me, obviously, I didn't say that to him. You know, and and um, inside that's what I said. And he said that he said this thing you're playing, it's like a swear word. But it's um, it's like because a, it's, because like it's not in the language, it's not in the vocab, it's not in the Bible. You know, so it's considered as a rude swear word, and so you're not supposed to play that. I was just going to say, but it's, this is exactly what you'd expect from a snare drum, which yeah. is what you were doing as yeah, well. Yeah, ex exactly. So there's a lot of also taken from drum set, because I love, love playing drum set. I love listening to drum set and many different drummers and grooves. And, um, and I think we're, what, 100, 100 years next year? Next year, yeah, 2018 is apparently 100 years of the drum set. So there's a huge celebration going to happen. And, and, and we forget, like, the drum set has had a huge influence on the world of music, you know. So, so it's amazing. And I think I've, I, as a double player, I've been invited by, you know, some establishments next year to celebrate um, hundred years of the drum set and I, I was like wow but I'm playing doubla but that's the great thing about drumming it's such of a you know universal uh, phenomena and um, what I saw you perform on Sunday actually you had uh, what I would yeah, describe thanks, as more thanks for coming well, it, was, it was phenomenal <laughs> rainy, <laughs> rainy day it felt like the first day of autumn but uh, and I'll ask you a bit more about that because it was a collaboration and it was you know very very interesting what you were doing but you had a, uh, a what what I would describe as a sub uh, tabla, which you you might tell us about. But you were also using a um, a Korg uh, snare pad as well. Yeah. Which was, so it was it was fantastic to see you, you know, putting the two instruments. You know, the sub was a bit like a kick and the snare plus the tabla and to see you playing the two things at the same time. In a way. Yeah. No, that that particular drum doesn't come out very often. Um, but I've been using the bass drum. So basically the story of that is which I was at some rehearsal. I became very close friends with Budgie, who now lives in Berlin. And uh, because I loved that band when I was a kid, I heard Happy House. And in particular, like this drumming style with mallets. And I really liked this drummer. And then the, um, the Blue Note Club, which was in Hoxton Square, where we hosted a a club night uh, called Anoka, which was for about three, four years on a Monday night. Before that, it was the bass clef. It was a bass, it was, um, yeah, it was a great, it was really cool kind of alternative underground jazz club. You know, it wasn't Ronnie Scott's, which had, had its own kind of idea and space. And uh, so the bass clef, I, I'd done something there and um, and Budgie, I met Budgie, and Budgie said, "Look, we've got this band." I said, "Of course, I know the band." And he said, "Would you like to?" I played on some few records, and uh, of theirs, and then that one one particular record, "Kiss Them for Me," the song, the tabla was quite prominent on that record. So when they were going out on tour. You know, and they, they're a punk band. They're not going to have a sampler playing like a loop. They're not into that. So they were like, look, why don't we ask Darwin to come on tour with us? And so they asked me to come on tour, and, and uh, I said, okay, let's do it. We rehearsed, and then I said, no. I said, look, I can't, I'm really sorry, I, Budgie, I can't do this. He said, why, what's wrong? And I said, it's just too loud for me. I can't, my, my instrument's really soft, and I'm just drowned. I'm just, like, feeling, like, I'm feeling sick, like my voice is gone, and I just can't do this. And then they sat me down, and the techs, and you know, they started kind of blaming the crew for certain things, and bringing the wrong mics, and and then and then this guy called Dave Newton, who was a wonderful, amazing kind of just brilliant person, great drum tech, 
but I, he was more than that. He was many things. He was just a great technician. So Dave was supposed to kind of help me set up certain things. And I was playing a lot of other percussion. I had a big rig. I had one of those big mega rigs. And the, you know, the Rhythm magazine were like calling me and saying, well, we'll put you in the front cover and stuff. <laughs> and um, so we were about to go on this really long tour, like six, seven months. And so I found these drums from a Chinese musical shop, music shop in Camden. And they were these odd looking doublas. I had seen them, I had seen them in that shop and, and just laughed at them kind of thing. And then when we were rehearsing, I, you know, we had a few days off and then I went into that store and I, I brought those drums. They were tablas with, with nut bolts like on congas, so they didn't have the leather straps. And they were from Pakistan, I think. And I said, okay, well, the skins sounded terrible. I said, that's okay, I've got, I, I can get skins. I said, can I have those drums, please? So I took them to the rehearsal. And uh, another friend of mine, Keith LeBlanc, incredible drummer, amazing drummer, um, he's moved to, uh, back to the States now. And he taught me a lot. I became friends with Keith, and Keith started kind of getting me into MIDI triggering and audio to MIDI and technology. And so he said to me, he said, look, he, he had this incredible drum set which was all internally mic'd. And he would have a small little mixer and triggers. So I said, Keith, look, what's those microphones inside those toms? And he said, oh, yeah, you know, the, the, um, they're like Shaw uh, SM57 capsules, you know. And I said, oh, okay, that, that sounds really good. Where can I get those from? He said, you know, I'll give you Shaw's number, you know, they'll, they'll give them to you. And, and uh, so I had the number. I spoke to Dave Newton. I said, Dave, I've got an idea. You see these drums, right? Let's, I opened them up and I said, let's put these internal microphones in them. He said, why would you want to do that? I said, because I'm drowned and this way, you know, there won't be spillage. It's not going to be the same, but it might sound even better. I said, let's do it. Let's try this. And um, so we did it. He, 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 he drilled holes for me, and, and we put the stuff inside. We put other special secret things inside for the acoustic, you know. And we did stuff. And, and then I had this rack, and I said, look, let's put the tablets on the rack. I don't want to play sit cross-legged looking like Alibaba or something. I'm not into that right now. I want to play standing up, and I want, I want the doubler on a rack, okay? And I, I'm going to get some foot pedals. I want some distortion, you know, and some flanges. So that's within two, three days, there was this birth of this, this kind of hybrid, this, this doubler, which just for me, it was the best thing ever happened at that time because... I was really enjoying myself. I could play anywhere. We started taking, I started playing with electronics so much, met Square Pusher, we did gigs together. You know, I basically the, the instrument was kind of, yeah, it, it just found, a, it was, it found a new space. It found, it could enter a space of voltage, volume. This is a very soft instrument. And, and so that, that's the bass drum from that, the tablatronics. But I don't really play the system anymore, you know. Um, I'm just more involved in the kind of acoustic side now. But, but who knows, maybe I'll kind of try to develop something with somebody, um, which, I mean, I, I, I wanted to speak to Roly. I did have a meeting with Roly, and I said, look, you know, I don't think there's any kind of electron. I mean, it, I, I had said to them, let me come and do a presentation of the Dabla, of the architecture of the Dabla, and let's see how we can use that architecture and make some kind of controller, because there's nothing out there. The wave drum's great, you know, the wave drum's great, um, but because it's a kind of, uh, kind of, microphonic system is prone to feedback again 
but I love it and and um, you know I use it I use it quite a lot and I use it in the studio as well. That's um, yeah. Well, I think that that's a, a discussion worth having. <laughs> Definitely, <laughs> I'm sure it's it's certainly especially when you talk about education and you know bringing tablet to to different people and different audiences and so on. Um, we've got about 20 minutes, and I just wondered if maybe we could convince you to play a little bit more and then maybe take some more audience questions, if that's okay. Yep, sure, thank, thank you, Rob.
Alvin, fantastic oh, performance. Uh, oh, thank you. I, is there a tension between the tradition and the appropriation of the tradition, do you think? Ten tension? Yeah, a sort of cultural tension. Um, yeah, I suppose the... Yeah, definitely, I suppose there is. I think the tension is, is sometimes what kind of excites me, but yet feels like a challenge in terms of um, trying to harmonize that tension. Does that make, make sense in a way? Yeah, I mean, it's something that happens in lots of different musical spaces, isn't it? Yeah. Like all yeah. the gospel music's been used or Latin percussion, you know, and certainly with the kind of work you're doing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think the kind of... Um, yeah, especially in terms of like this particular kind of, I suppose, the, the space of, um, I mean, in the 70s, you know, there was this whole kind of East meets West uh, with Ravi Shankar. And Shanti. actually, this piece was a tribute to Pandit Ravi Shankar. So the, the day he kind of, you know, left this physical space, I, I wrote this piece and, and it's been, it, it always changes. It's just one of those ideas I have and it's constantly evolving. But at that time, I think in, in the 70s, you know, there was this kind of East meets West uh, kind of harmony trying to happen and, and with the Beatles being involved in Indian music and, and drawing from Indian ragas just to expand the kind of... Um, the, the, the chord progressions uh, and the scales being influenced from a restrictive kind of scale where a five note scale. Um, so, so I think, you know, it's those challenges which I think uh, start, um, you know, bringing us uh, new ideas and new experiences in music. Hi. Um, you spoke about beginning as serving other people's projects uh, for many years and growing tired of that. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about your journey into your own vision and that transition. Um, I hear some of your music is stories, and I was wondering if stories were a hook for you, a kind of way in, or what your general kind of inspiration and journey was through that, you know, first album and thereafter. Uh, the sin yeah, it's interesting with um, your ob observations, interesting, but because I think the times I've released, I mean, in terms of releasing music, I've been, um, yeah, I wouldn't even say slow, but so minimal. Uh, but I've, I've I, you know, I write music almost every day and, um, and it's, um, I think the music which has been released that probably does have 
that kind of narrative and story, even though it's not in a conventional song structure. And but that but that's something which um, which I'm still learning really about because there, there's sometimes you you know you can make music, um, but it's definitely you know th there has to be a narrative. It doesn't always have to be, but but I think having a beginning and a middle and an end, you know, that's still a form uh, which is a universal form in terms of art. You know, having, um, you know, a kind of a, a beginning and then ha within that, ha starting having conversations, uh, questions, little answers or phrases, motives, and then in the middle saying something and then going to a different direction and then an end. So those kind of patterns. But that's something which I'm learning because I haven't traditionally learned composition. Um, and, um, you know, so I've had to to observe and try ideas. And I think now I'm starting to, I feel I'm just starting to learn what that is, you know, and um, it's it's good, it, yeah, it's, it's a good thing. Do you find that the technology, because within the technology of programming and what have you, it, it regulated the beat, and in, in a lot of the Indian music and in Bhangra and in, in Ragas and whatever, yeah tempo changes mm. as choruses come in or whatever, it becomes yeah. more excited and everyone... Do, do you think that the technology creates a restriction for your playing or has it driven you to new vistas, as it were? Yeah, now that, that's interesting. Well, I, the last couple of days, I suppose I've, I suppose I've had like... Yeah, the last three days I've had quite an extreme experience of, of, of what, what you're talking about because on Sunday I had a collaboration uh, with uh, an artist from, from South India, from Madras and we played in Bombay six months ago together for the first time and he plays Moog, Moog synthesizers like the kind of the mother 32s and, and this time he also had a Roland um, the new version of the 808 drum machine, but all uh, pretty much kind of uh, arpeggio sequencing, and uh, and and I, you know, when we first when we first met, actually, was in um, a festival in Bangalore, and I had introduced him to another musician from the UK and said, "Look, you've got to check out this guy's music. His name is Vinayaka. He makes incredible electronic music." And he, he corrected me, he said, no, I make Indian electronic music. And since that day, it started making me kind of think, well, what is Indian electronic music? You know, because surely in electronic music is universal. It doesn't belong to any kind of national space, maybe. I mean, I was debating it in my mind, what that, what that meant. But, at, but I also respected it, and there was something in there. Um, so I wanted to meet him again, and... And we ended up, we had an opportunity um, to play in Bombay and we took that opportunity and it was, it, was, it was great and it was a good experience. Then we played on Sunday. I did invited him because I, again, I got an opportunity to curate like eight hours of music and, um, and, and so we, we played about 90 minutes together. And it was all very kind of, Obviously, it was very metronomic. And when I finished that particular gig, Rob, Rob was great, Rob, Rob came and experienced it. Uh, when I had finished that, I did think, well, hold on, that's, that's again, that's years of playing tabla with a metronomic. Because I've done that so much, you know, for me, it's like, it's not, it comes natural. And it felt really good. It felt really, really good. Um, because I felt Dabla was singing at a different space and the audience were hearing like dance music on a classical instrument played in that way and sonically also quite wide. Yesterday, I had a completely different experience where I had to record a song for a movie, for an Indian film. And it was in sevens 
seven time signature, but a beautiful soft groove, a lovely melody, and um, some nice felt piano on it, and some strings, and um, and I thought, okay, I need a click track. I, I need a click. Um, I I went in and kind of recorded, you know, double R tuned it, and the rhythm was like kind of. So I had, I was playing it fine because the piano was giving the rhythm, the felt piano. But the natural thing was like, oh no no no. But I had so I recorded a mock, you know, to make sure the EQ is right and stuff and the tracking. And then I went and heard it. I said, yeah, it sounds good. I'm happy with the tone. So I may as well go in and do the take. And I thought, no no, but I need a click track. So I sat there thinking, well, do I really need a click track? I mean, the piece is on a click, it's metronomic, but there's a looseness in the track, which is really beautiful. And I thought, well, hold on, am I going to play different if I have a tick, 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 tick going on in my ears? Is it going to influence my groove? Essentially, you sometimes need a click. So that's a different thing. But because the piano had enough of the rhythm, I was actually fine without the click. But yet I was saying, no, but I need a click. Um, and then I decided, you know, let me just do this. And I kind of, yeah, I suppose at times I just ignored. I did have a little ticky tick in there just for some reference, but I actually ignored the click. And, and, and I went with, I purposely used the click to play forward and behind the beat. And so, so instead of playing... I started playing... So then you get this kind of, uh, you know, groove. And I love also there's a lot of Indian rhythms which are based on the walks of animals. Like my, my teacher taught me this five rhythm, which is called Asule Fakta. And he said, look, this is based on a pigeon, pigeon's walk. <laughs> and it goes, But if you play it, if you play the rhythm again metronome, it doesn't give you that feeling. But if you start playing take five. You know, if you start swinging it, then it becomes more musical. But I sorry, I just want but it's interesting, I've heard a lot of dance music recently with amazing tempo changes, you know, so it's, it, it's really exciting how people are now thinking, okay, well, I want to draw in tempo changes. It's and and that's, that definitely comes from the, you know, the push and pull, doesn't it, of tra yeah. mixing traditional with, with, with more sort of contemporary music. But um, we're going to wrap up. I'm afraid I would ask lots more questions, but I just wondered if maybe we could ask you to play just for a couple more minutes, just to just to 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 to, sh to sort of finish off what's been a, a really wonderful uh, presentation and event. So uh, thank, if that's okay, you. sure, sure. Thank you. I'd love to. Uh, maybe I won't play double R because the um yeah the open mics and uh, you know maybe we can. Um, I have a small, um, smallish pair of his monitors, um, PMCs, and uh, you know, so it'll be nice to play something just di just direct, like a production, so we can also feel these these amazing amazing speakers and how they how they sound, how they respond. Um, I'll just have to think what I'm going to play. Is there any 
I don't know what's, what does what do we want to hear? Because things have changed. My life has really changed recently. Um, living in Suffolk, you know, you wake up five in the morning and there's an orchestra, like a symphony of birds singing. And then, and then the studio is in the old US Air Base, which was once acquired by the US um, as an air base. And I get in the studio and it's just quiet. You turn on your equipment and, um, and you just think, well, what am I going to do now? Like, well, you know, I've heard this incredible music every morning. And um, so where do you start? So I'm now kind of feel a different space where I feel like I need someone to kind of tell me what they want me to make. make. And I never thought I'll be in that space ever because when I made, made my first few albums, in fact, when I recorded OK, the record company promised me, Mark Moreau, who was the managing director, he's, Mark said, I said, look, no one's going to hear anything until the record's finished. And he said, OK. And that, that was the case. We finished that record, and I played it to Mark, and he said, OK. He loved it, loved what he was hearing. And, and then he said, so is there a single? And I played him Traveller, which was like 14 minutes long. <laughs> you know, so I said, that's the single. You know, so it's... And at that point, nobody could tell me what, like, the relationship with the record company, I wanted to make sure no one's going to tell me what to make or interfere. And now it's kind of the opposite where I need someone to call me and say, listen, there's a story, we're making this movie and we need this type of music. And, and then I try to get into that space. Obviously, you know, you involve your personality because that's your, pers that's your experience. Uh, but it's amazing how things change and you know, life and space can like just change, flip. Yeah, I think this piece I did like in Icon in Suffolk, and it's really not a Suffolk style piece at all. You know, so that's a good thing because I think somebody, a friend asked me the other day, oh, you know, living like the outside of an urban environment or the, in the periphery of, of a city, especially if you know the city, Aren't you, aren't you getting kind of de-influenced, you know? And, um, and I was like, no, not really, you know, because I can, I, I suppose I could just tap into the space. Um, Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you.